Hi everybody, Mike here. Before we get started, there's been a lot of passings in the last week or so, and I'd normally put clips in here for a person who had passed, but we have lost literally four or five people of significance just since the last episode was finalized. With that, please rest in peace to Benji Gregory and Dr. Ruth and Richard Simmons and Shannon Doherty and James B. Seeking. You are all legends and you will be missed. Hello, everybody. It's me, Johnny Olson, and I'm here as your guide for the final episode of Deadpool and Wolverine Month. You know, I wasn't around for the age of comic book movies. I mean, yeah, I was around for Superman and all that, and I did play Captain Klutz in a Price is Right showcase one time. But, dear lord, Greg and Chico are so obsessed with their damn superhero movies. Enough already, guys. But this episode is about Laughlin. I know, I don't think we ever offered a trip to Laughlin on The Price is Right, ever. Maybe we offered a prize to Rita one time. But I think that was it. Well, in this episode, Hugh Jackman sings, dances, and of course Shelly from Twin Peaks is involved, although you know that Greg's gonna love that. All right, here we go. Viva Laughlin! To wrap up Deadpool and Wolverine Month on It Was a Thing on TV! An anthology about the bad, the short-lived, and the forgotten shows and events in television history. This is It Was a Thing on TV. Punisher! Control! Tell me before I change my mind! I give you Super Train! Episode 483, submission number 1208, Viva Laughlin. Viva Laughlin aired on the CBS television network from <laughs> October 18th to October 21st, 2007 for eight episodes, six of which went unaired. So if my math is correct... That would mean that this show lasted for two episodes. That is one eighth of a crock block. I think we should call any series that lasts two episodes now Aviva Laughlin. So think about it, guys. If we ever cover the Rich List, the U.S. version, that would be half of Aviva Laughlin. Or Emily's reasons why not. The possibilities are endless. Greg. You are the resident historian and the keeper of the list. Is this a new record for <laughs> fewest episodes of a show that we've covered on this podcast? I can answer that very easily. The answer is no, because we've covered Turn On. They did have that second episode that aired on YouTube sometime last year, but we don't have that. Well, it's not like it aired last year on YouTube. It's still there, but... It did go unaired back in 1967 or 68 or... Oh, God, I don't want to say this. 69, get it out of your system. Nice. nice. Uh, now, okay. Now, do you want to know the episodes that we've covered from 2007? Hit us with it. Okay, we got the BCS on Fox that started in 07. The second one, and it originates in 2007 in the timeline, because we do have a commercial from this episode from 2007. The other Super Bowl commercials of Daryl Isaacs. The How I Met Your Mother Super Bowl episode. Acceptable.tv. Uh, Lil Bush. Golden Balls. Kid Nation. 
Pushing Daisies, Xavier Renegade Angel, and the worst Monday night football game ever from 2007 between the Steelers and Dolphins. The epic 3 nothing game. And actually, I'm taking a look at the shows that we've covered that have lasted half of Eva Laughlin. You're going to have to get used to that. I think that's brilliant. Australia's Naughtiest Home Videos. Talked about Turn On, but also we talked about Videos After Dark. So two shows that involved home videos lasted one episode. Oh, and Co-Ed Fever 2. So there's three that we've talked about in one, The Rich List, which we're going to eventually talk about, probably. Wait, isn't that four? Yes, four that we've talked about, plus obviously eventually we're going to talk about The Rich List. So five total. We're not going to play The Open because really The Open is just a quick little five-second blurb. Not even joking about that. So instead, enjoy what could have been the theme song. Viva Laughlin, Viva Laughlin, Viva, Viva Laughlin. No? Well, it was either that or David Morrissey singing Viva Las Vegas. Point of relevance. Because David Morrissey originated the role of Ripley Holden on the original show called Blackpool but brought over to the U.S. on BBC America as Viva Blackpool. And one of his co-stars on that show was a young Scotsman by the name of David Tennant. I wonder what he's doing now. Yeah. He's probably voicing Scrooge McDuck or something. I don't know. I heard he's a doctor. In fact, I heard he's been a doctor twice. Doctor Who? Yes. No, I'm asking, Doctor Who? Exactly, Doctor Who. Did you enjoy our joke, ladies and gentlemen? Anyway, the plot of the original show, Viva Blackpool, concerns the murder of a young man in a Blackpool arcade and how it affects the people involved in the arcade and the investigation thereupon. As the investigation proceeds, it takes a toll on the characters, namely Ripley Holden, under suspicion of murder, finds his public and private life slowly unraveling as both his bullying nature and his long-forgotten demons from his past return to haunt him. So how is he going to exercise all of these demons? By turning his humble arcade into a Las Vegas-style casino, y'all. And also singing his way through his troubles. Not unlike Glee, Future entry Smash or previous entry Cop Rock. Peter Boker created and wrote this series, which lasted a healthy six episodes and a movie in the UK, all of which we saw on BBC America. It was a hit for BBC America, and this was around the time when hits that were on BBC America were being adapted for American audiences. See previous entry coupling and never cover the office so david boker decided to team up with bob laurie to bring viva blackpool to the u.s but they couldn't use blackpool obviously they had to use something a little bit like las vegas but off the strip if you know what i'm talking about I don't know how they came up with Laughlin, but Viva Laughlin! CBS Paramount Network Television bought into it, Sony Pictures bought into it, and of course, the BBC had their hands in the cookie jar as well. The series was greenlit on May 14th, 2007 for a full season of 13 episodes. And where are we going to pub the hell out of this show where else the 61st annual Tony Awards think about it it's a murder mystery comedy drama musical sure okay yeah what Greg said and it's airing on CBS which is the home of the Tonys okay I can buy this CBS is the musical network okay so everybody is Getting ready 
I know that's CBS in 1990, but this is 2007. But everybody is getting ready for Viva Laughlin. Did we mention one of the producers they got to executive produce this show, aside from the two creators, was a uh, actor slash singer from Australia who happened to have stage presence and a heck of a lyric baritone, from what I understand. No, seriously, go back and listen to A Million Dreams from The Greatest Showman. It'll change your life. It was Hugh Jackman. Wait, Wolverine is on a show on CBS. Okay, now I know this is coming off the disaster that was X3 The Last Stand, and we don't talk about X3 The Last Stand. We don't want to acknowledge it ever happened, and I'm sure, like, Fox doesn't want to. Well, Fox didn't want to acknowledge that it happened because I think they retconned all that in Deeds of Future Past, but still, Hugh Jackman coming off X-Men is like, okay, I guess I'm sold by this. Well, you have to remember, this was the point of Hugh Jackman's career where he's like, yes, I am Wolverine, but I'm more than that. I'm also the boy from Oz. That's right. He played Peter Allen in The Boy from Oz on Broadway. And again, heck of a lyric baritone, let me tell you. So a show like this would be right up his alley. He does not play Ripley Holden in the U.S. version, though. Oh, he doesn't? Who does he play in this version? He plays a character by the name of Nikki Fontana. What kind of a name is Nikki Fontana? That sounds like the name of a lead singer in a Motley Crue tribute band. But who do they get to play Ripley Holden? They get a guy who is similar to, but legally distinct from, Hugh Jackman. They get British actor, well, technically a British-born Welsh actor, Lloyd Owen. Nowadays can be seen in the role of Ellen Dill in The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power on Prime Video. But you probably remember him as Dr. Henry Jones Sr. in The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. Oh, yeah, The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. Remember that? That was like very hyped, and it was like, what the hell is this? Oh, my God. I just had a brainstorm. He's young Sean Connery. That's right, he is. In the young Indiana Jones Chronicles, he's the younger version of Sean Connery's character in The Last Crusade. Henry Jones Sr. You know what I think about this show, Chico? What? You should have mailed it to the Mox Brothers. He looks like, he sings like, he moves like Hugh Jackman. But he's Welsh instead of Australian. Oh, okay, he's Welsh. Do the Welsh have good singers? Oh, definitely. Off the top of my head, I can't name one, but give me a moment. I'm sure there's somebody on Welcome to Wrexham who's like in some kind of theater troupe that sings. You're trying to find the name of a famous Welsh singer? Yes. Tom Jones? Oh, Thank yeah. you. You know what? In retrospect, it's not unusual. Yeah, I cannot take you guys anywhere. Then you have Natalie Holden, Ripley's shy, frustrated, and lonely wife whom Ripley takes for granted and to whom other characters take a shine. Natalie, in this version, is played by Machin Amik. Greg, yes. Greg, the floor is yours. Yeah, Shelly from Twin Peaks. And, you know, anytime I can mention Twin Peaks, of course. You know, one of the sexiest scenes in Twin Peaks is when she's playing with that gun with Bobby. I need to say, teach me, Bobby. I'm telling you, sexy as hell. That's one of the best scenes on Twin Peaks. Also, when this is done, folks, Google on YouTube, Match and Amik, Sleepwalkers, Do You Love Me? Just saying. Also plays a character on Riverdale which is similar to, but legally distinct from Twin Peaks. You know what her, the name of her character is? What? Alice Cooper. <laughs> Remember, she is Betty's mother, isn't she? 
She is Betty's mother. I just had to laugh at the name. I grew up on the Archies. I did not know the name of Betty's mother. It's like, what's her name? Alice Cooper. You know, Riverdale was the best thing they did with the Archie property since Archie versus Predator, which is a real comic book, by the way, Mike. Archie against the Predator. I think I've heard of that, believe it or not. Yeah. Meanwhile, Ripley and Natalie have a spoiled daughter named Cheyenne. She worships her doting father, but is cruel and distant to her mother. Cheyenne is played by Ellen Woglum, who was a that girl from that thing until she hit it big in 2017 with Inhumans. Oh, God. I just want to bring up the first thing she's ever, well, the first thing that matters that she's ever been in. A Disney Channel original movie, Wendy Wu Homecoming Warrior, with Brenda Song, Shin Koyamada, and Sally Martin from Shortland Street and Power Rangers Ninja Storm. And let's not forget Brenda Song, Mrs. Macaulay Culkin. Playing the role of Jack Holden, Carter Jenkins, best known for films mostly, Alien to the Attic, Valentine's Day, Struck by Lightning, and the After series based on the novels by Anna Todd. But he was also in shows like Surface and Famous in Love. I don't know what either of those are. But he was on an unsold CW reboot of Tales from the Dark Side. Playing Peter Carlyle, the detective assigned to investigate the murder at the heart of the series, a charming, good-natured, and gluttonous, although extremely manipulative, police officer who dislikes Ripley almost on sight, Eric Winter, best known for his role as Tim Bradford on The Rookie, and for an appearance in Harold and Kumar Escape from Guantanamo Bay. Oh, what a classic. Harold and Kumar Escape from Guantanamo Bay. Now, the best thing in the Blu-ray is there's a bonus feature in Harold and Kumar Escape from Guantanamo Bay, which is like Choose Your Own Adventure style. And some of the fake endings in the movie when you make the wrong choice are hilarious. Oh, by the way, Jack Holden is supposed to be the American version of Danny Holden from the original version. So Jack Holden is Ripley and Natalie's troubled and awkward son who is constantly belittled by his father. In the role of Marcus Hankman is D.B. Woodside. He was Robin Wood in Buffy the Vampire Slater. Slater. Wait, hold on a second. Mario Lopez was in that? No. <laughs> this is another show that we put for our fictional TV network. So D.B. Woodside, best known for roles on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Murder One, Season 2, and 24, Seasons 3, 5, and 6. Nowadays, you can see him on several episodes of 911 Lone Star, a.k.a. 911 The One on Fox. Because remember, 911 The Mothership is now on ABC. So if you want to get your Angela Bassett fix, you got to go to ABC. If you want to get your Rob Lowe fix, you go to Fox. Unfortunately, Rob Lowe is not going to be wearing an NFL hat on 911 The Lone Star. Wait, wait. 911 The Lone Star? Yeah. Is that another show on the network? Does that follow I, Buffy the Vampire Slater? I thought I said 911 The Lone Star. I didn't know who said the. I heard 911 The Lone Star. So you know what? It's on the network. <laughs> it's going to come on before Batman 66. And if it's 911, the Lone Star, it's going to star Bill Pullman. It'll be like a sequel to Spaceballs. No, it will not be the sequel to Spaceballs, because the sequel to Spaceballs is actually happening. Oh, that's right. Josh Gad's doing the Spaceballs sequel. Spaceballs 2, the search for more money. Oh, finally, it's going to be like, what, 37 years, 38 years. We're going to finally find the search for more money. I can only imagine... What's going to happen with that? Playing Buddy Baxter, 
Melody Griffith. And really, what can we say about Melody Griffith? Just an absolute legend. Hollywood royalty, Tippi Hendren's daughter, and she's the mother of Dakota Johnson. Okay, hold on a second. Let's finally make this joke since I mentioned Dakota Johnson. What do you think Melanie Griffith was doing in the Amazon? Don Johnson. Good night, everybody. <laughs> no, no, no. She's probably researching spiders in the Amazon. Because <laughs> get it? That was from the trailer. I get it. And rounding out the cast as a character by the name of Jonesy, PJ Byrne who played Nicky Rugrat Koskoff in The Wolf of Wall Street and Bolin in The Legend of Korra from 2012 to 2014. But that's basically the long and short of the cast. I mean, there are more people, but let's be honest, you're probably not going to remember them on this show. I don't even think they remember them on this show. In other words, to quote the great Mike Francesa, who cares? 945 is the Mink Man. We start with the pilot. Sleazy entrepreneur Ripley Holden hopes to turn a small time casino into a dreamy Las Vegas style resort. Despite seemingly insurmountable challenges, such as the death of his former business partner and a lack of money. A lack of what, Chico? A lack of money. Money. I could only pick two real names that we did not talk about yet. Playing Steve is future It Was a Thing Hall of Famer, Professor Lasky himself, an all around heel, Patrick Fabian. And playing Buddy Baxter, who I imagine is the murdered business partner, Wings Hauser. <laughs> Wings Hauser? Wings Hauser. Now, hold on a second. I got a question. Do you think that Wings Hauser's favorite television show was Wings, just like mine is Wings? And do you think he also thinks that it made Tony Shalhoub's career? Which, by the way, guys, I don't know if you've realized this, but it's now been 183 episodes since for the first time ever on this podcast, I mentioned that I love Wings. Now, I wonder... Did Tony Shalhoub make Wings Hauser's career? Think about it. I'll tell you what made Wings Hauser's career. The Last Precinct, which we talked about a bit of time ago. He was also in a movie in 1982 called Vice Squad, where he played a character named, and I'm not even joking, Ramrod. Oh, God. Now, guys, I want to share with you this picture that I have on my phone. Now, Steven Weber posted this on threads a few days ago, but here he is. He's having dinner with Tim Daly right here. Are they talking about the time Tony Shalhoub broke the lamp? No, I think they're talking about the time Tony Shalhoub prevented that one Boston Bruins goalie or player from attending a game, and it ruined their winning streak, and everyone got mad at him. I thought they'd be talking about the blimp. Oh, yeah. Four lulls. God damn it, boy. You should have knocked. And where we may remember Wings Hauser from, we did cover him previously. He was on one episode of Magruder and Loud. This was not taped in Laughlin, Nevada. It was taped in Southern California. And the exterior of the old Robinson's department store next to the Beverly Hilton in Beverly Hills sticks out like a sore thumb. I'm ripped off now. This show is not taped anywhere near Nevada. Maybe a two-hour drive through the desert. They could have driven two hours and taped this somewhere in Nevada. Like, anywhere. Las Vegas, Reno, Lake Tahoe, Carson City. <laughs> okay, we did that last week. And why did you have to do that in a Telly Savalas voice? Are you going to start giving us tips on Blackjack? I gotta say, that Telly Savalas How to Win at Blackjack tape is amazing. Never did I think that Telly Savalas would be such a great teacher of Blackjack. Now I'm waiting for him to teach us how to use hookers so we can pull out the Bender clip. With Blackjack and hookers! Now hold on, with the advances of AI, 
You think we can? Oh, no, no, oh, Lord. no. With, with no, the advances no, in AI, no, no. I, I'm You're done not... with the advances in AI. We could, cr- we could create a- AI Kelly Savalas that teaches you how to play blackjack. I'm gonna go with no on that, Greg. I'm gonna go with no. Oh come on, this would be great. I would anticipate Kelly Zavallis teaching us how to play baccarat. I'm gonna go with no, simply on the baccarat alone. Baccarat is the casino game for people who hate money. <laughs> now hold on, what about AI Kelly Zavallis trying to teach you how to play Kino? No, now that's a ripoff. That's more than a ripoff than. Akira, in my opinion. Okay, so Chico, since you are the expert, the degenerate gambler in the room. I am the degenerate gambler in the room. You didn't even need to admit that. What casino game should Telly Savalas have taught us next after Blackjack? Three card. He's not wrong there. I think that would be kind of interesting. I think Pai Gao 2 would be another one that... Oh. Yo, yo. Oh. Hey, hey, Gordon Pepper. If you no, 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 no. <laughs> Say yeah, his don't name but he appears. <laughs> Gordon, Gordon, Gordon Pepper's going to appear in the Telly Savalas teaches Pai Gal video. And he's got his box of tiles with him. Look at oh, my boy! Okay. <laughs> okay. For more information about that, go to episode 18, First Night 2013, featuring current Monday Night Raw general manager Adam Pierce. There's another episode. No, I want to hear about Telly Savalas teaching us how to play craps. That's another good one. Oh, yo, I don't even, yo, man, let me tell you something. For the last month or so, I've been watching in between Secret Galaxy, Binging with Babish, and a metric crap ton of body cam videos. Welcome to Audit the Audit. <laughs> I've been watching Color Up and Casino Quest on YouTube. That's right. I've been watching Crap Tube. Well, I said craps is in the dice throwing game, not Crap Tube or whatever. But I'm sorry. Me and Greg, we're spending our time watching Me Tunes TV. No, no, Me TV Tunes. <laughs> But <laughs> damn that's it. going on the list yeah. too. That's no, that, going that, on the no, list. no, 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 no. That's the spinoff network. So when our network yeah goes off the air, it goes to Me Tunes TV. But again, the point being, Greg and I, the last basically three weeks, we have spent like every waking moment watching Me TV. I almost did Me Tunes TV again. Me TV Tunes, specifically. For the Bullwinkle. And the Fox station in Raleigh is a MeTV affiliate, but has not picked up MeTV tunes. Why? Yeah, make it make sense. So, okay, making her debut on this podcast, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I want to introduce to you all the legendary Miss Jane Moosefield. Miss Moosefield. It's so great to finally have you on this podcast. What do you have to say? Hello, handsome. This is a recording. I know, Miss Moosefield. It's very great to have you on this podcast. Now, I got to say, isn't this great to meet some of the guys? I mean, you met Johnny. You met Alan Thicke. You met everybody. I mean, what is it like to be around such greatness amongst all these characters on this podcast? Hello, handsome. This is a recording. I know. I I would be speechless if I were you. I mean, it's so amazing to be with this, but it's a crazy show, Miss Boosfield. I'm sure you're going to love it. Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Okay, Miss Moosefield, we could chat all day, but you have to all right, go over there with... Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Craig, do you understand that She's just saying one word? I don't know what you're talking about, Johnny. Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Yeah, I mean, come on. I don't know what you're on about, Johnny. But this woman is, like, amazing. She's got great range. She's a great actress. I don't know why you're putting her down, Johnny. She's saying one goddamn thing all the time, Greg. Johnny, you're just a one-note character who 
has come back from the dead and is haunting my house. Okay? I don't want you to put down talent like Jane Moosefield. All right? So go away. Go away, Johnny. I would like to thank Greg for actually making the completely mental misadventures of Ed Grimley seem normal. Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Oh, my gosh. I wonder what she would say about meeting Lloyd Owen. Hello, handsome. This is a recording. She only says one thing. That's the joke. Hey, we have a whole other episode to talk about, don't we? Yeah, but first, just for the people at home, if you look up Banana Formula, Rocky and Bullwinkle on YouTube, you can find this. I'm not going to tell you exactly where. Watch the whole thing. Because it's absolutely hilarious. The simplest way of describing what Greg's doing or talking about is Boris and Natasha create a model of Bullwinkle when he falls into a vat of cement and basically just creates a mold out of him. And from that mold, they create a plastic version of Bullwinkle but dress him up as a female. And the only thing that she can say is... Hello, handsome. This is a recording. That you've heard like five or six times in the last like three minutes. Oh my gosh, that is just absolutely hilarious. And we're gonna hear more of it in the future. I'm not telling where. Not this episode, though. I will tell you that. Hey Mike, you forgot to mention one key detail. This is a recording. She is a real bombshell. Let's just Oh my gosh. <laughs> Boom! Oh, well, there it well, goes again! Well, well, there you go. There, there, that works in two ways there. She's a bombshell. Boom! <laughs> hey, everybody, it's me, <laughs> Bullwinkle. I heard somebody was calling my name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Lord. Hey, where's Jane Moosefield? She's right over there, Bullwinkle. Oh, Jane Moosefield. Oh, it's so great to see you again. Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Oh, yeah, you sexy thing, you Jane Moosefield. All right, I'm going to be on my way, Greg. If he stayed around any longer with Jane Moosefield, this might have to be an explicit episode. Might have to get the dirty E on iTunes. Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again! Nothing up my sleeve. Christo! Ah. Wrong hat! Must have picked the wrong hat. And now I'll bring you something you really didn't like. When did this turn into Rocky and Bullwinkle fan fiction? <laughs> Holy crap! <sighs> Rocky and Bullwinkle slash fiction, am I right? Oh, we do have one more episode, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have a whole other episode to talk about. Boy, I hope somebody like June Foray or... Bill Conrad appears in this episode. That would give us a tie back to Rocky and Bullwinkle. Oh, let's see. No, well, now one of them's dead and the other one would never be caught on this show. I don't Yeah, think. that's true. What a whale wants. Hello, handsome. This is a recording. After the disastrous opening of the Viva leaves the public believing the casino is cursed, Ripley tries to entice a famous high roller Sweet Letty away from Nikki in order to pack people into his casino. I'm looking for Sweet Lenny and I can't seem to find him. So either this is a mysterious character with no credit or it's one of those unseen dealies. I only see one name and that would be the person who plays Marilyn. Kimberly Brooks, known for her role as Laura in all of the episodes of Voltron Legendary Defender. She was also in 10 episodes of High School Musical, the musical, the series. AKA the show that gave us Olivia Rodrigo. Hold on, this may be a different Kimberly Brooks. Yeah, it's a different Kimberly Brooks. Oh, man, I've wasted my Olivia Rodrigo reference on that. No, the different Kimberly Brooks is on Voltron. The Kimberly Brooks that was on 
Viva Laughlin was on High School Musical, the musical, the series. Oh, okay, so I didn't waste my Olivia Rodrigo reference. No, you did not. Well, I wouldn't want to get it back, if you know what I mean. Because she's saying get her back. We get it! <laughs> Playing Bruiser is Bruno Amato, who is a recurring character named Gary in one of your favorite shows, Mike, Abbott Elementary. Don't put words in my mouth. So it's not one of your favorites, then? Okay. I've only seen it, like, twice. Oh, that's fine. Stupid me doesn't really, like, watch much network TV anymore. I totally get that. I'm part of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> that, but you know what? That's okay. Because I'm spending all my time watching on friendly TV, Me Tunes TV, specifically The Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle. Oh, did we talk about Jane Moosefield? <laughs> Oh, sexy Jane Moosefield. Isn't that right, Jane? Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Oh, my gosh. And we would love to let you know what happens in the rest of the series. But that's it. I mean, there were six other episodes that were planned out. Episode three, Taking Care of Business. Episode 4, Magic Carpet Ride. Episode 5, Bad Moon Rising. Episode 6, Need You Tonight. Episode 7, Fighter. And Episode 8, Would I Lie to You? In the middle of producing all of those episodes, CBS decided that it was going to win the Booby Prize for the 2007-2008 season, being... The first show canceled. 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 The first episode aired out of CSI on October 18th. CSI, the top rated show on Thursday nights. On this particular night, it had a 12.9 rating and a 19 share. The pilot for Viva Laughlin sunk like a stone to a 5.59 share. I will give the show credit, though. If you look at the episode titles, they have to do with rock songs. Well, take What a Whale Wants, replace Whale with Girl, What a Girl Wants, Taking Care of Business, Magic Carpet Ride, Bad Moon Rising, Need You Tonight. I don't know about Fighter necessarily, but yeah, they're all rock songs. Or maybe not rock songs, let's say pop songs. And then they put it on its regular slot on Sundays right after 60 Minutes and right before a cold case where it did a whole lot worse. 60 Minutes had a 7.6 rating and a 13 share. Viva Laughlin, 4.2 rating and a 6 share. Could not make a dent out of Extreme Makeover Home Edition or the ALCS. Red Sox 11, Indians 2, by the way. Oh, sorry. Red Sox 11, Guardians 2. Yeah, Mike, that exactly is how I felt in 2007. Would have been the easiest World Series in history if the Guardians went there. Because Colorado sucked. They, like rolled over everyone in the National League playoffs. Because I think they were undefeated, including they won the wild card tiebreaker against the Padres. So they were like eight and O going to that World Series and they got swept. But I do have in my closet for my relatives in Colorado a two thousand seven Colorado Rockies World Series Rocktober sweater. Speaking of Colorado or speaking of Sticky Ratto, you know what else was airing that night? What? Sunday Night Football. Denver Broncos 31, Pittsburgh Steelers 28. Oh, now I need to check the box score of this on football reference. Well, while you do that, the Indians were up 3-1 in that series, and they just let it go. They scored five runs in the last three games. Pathetic. Okay, I got the stats here. 
Ben Roethlisberger, 24 for 35, 290 yards, four touchdowns, two interceptions. Jay Cutler, 22 for 29, 248 yards, three touchdowns, two interceptions. So he had everything. He had touchdowns, he had interceptions. Let me just look at the rushers. Willie Parker for the Steelers had 93 yards. Travis Henry for the Broncos had 51 yards. Brandon Marshall for the Broncos had six catches for 77 yards. And Heinz Ward had seven catches for 78 yards. Santonio Holmes had six catches, 54 yards, and a touchdown. And I want to say this was Santonio Holmes' rookie year, or his second year. Second year in the league, because his rookie year would have been 06. It aired one time on Thursday nights, and almost immediately, it wasn't just called the worst show on television that particular time frame. It was perhaps the worst show in the history of television. The writing was terrible. The acting had absolutely no chemistry behind it. The only thing that made the show at least a bit palatable was the musical numbers. And even then, you had to have had a twisted sense of humor in order to watch it. Okay, who can tell me what's wrong with that clip? The gentleman from Cleveland. Everything. Correct. Everything. Specifically, are we talking about walking down the up escalator? Dancing down the up LS. Well, still, you, you're like going down, but it's going up, so you're like not moving at all. Not necessarily the dancing aspect, just you know, the, the net movement of zero. And then there's the whole, um, you really want to put the actual song in the background with Elton John singing instead of Lloyd o- Granted, Lloyd Owen is no Elton John. Not even close. This is one of those moments where you almost wish Hugh Jackman was playing Ripley, because at least Hugh Jackman can totally nail it but uh, yeah only two episodes aired and some markets didn't even go that far australia where it aired on the nine network canceled it after the first episode the uk it aired on both virgin one and living it was unknown canada it aired on e which used to be ch Canceled it after the second episode, which was seen an hour before we got it. One review said, Viva Laughlin on CBS may well be the worst news show of the season, but it is the worst show in the history of television. And another review said, The stud is a dud, and that's only the first of a dozen problems with CBS's admirably ambitious but jaw-droppingly wrong-headed new musical murder mystery family drama, Viva Laughlin. Let us count the ways it bombs. And we're just gonna say there was not a thing right with this show. And to this day, the remaining six episodes are considered lost media. And this is where I do my Robert Stack. For every mystery, there is someone somewhere who knows the truth. Perhaps that someone is listening. Perhaps it's you. I'm going to counter that by saying, if you know anything about the series, keep it to yourself. It's trash. No, I don't want this released on DVD. No, I don't want this to appear on streaming. Trash. So what was CBS to do with that time slot? Mostly run reruns of CSI and The Amazing Race. This is one of those shows where, I think I said this on this podcast before, it aired, it sucked, and it was canceled almost in the same breath. Give 
Viva Laughlin about as much credit as you can for being overly ambitious, but ultimately, it was just a blink and you'll miss it thing on TV. Well, that's going to do it for Deadpool and Wolverine month. We started it with a long-running soap opera, and we ended it with this piece of crap. But you know, we'll always have We'll always have the touching issue of Matt having a drinking problem. Oh, no, no, no. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't uh, have said that. Because he doesn't have a drinking problem. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Matt Walker does not have a drinking problem. Uh, Mike, get us out of this, would you please? I know something that lasted at least three episodes. It's time for this weekend match game. Hollywood Square. Our history. Guys, we're going to be done with this next week. This is the second to last week of Match Game in Hollywood Squares Hour. I know, I'm disappointed and upset too. So this week, we had Anne-Marie Martin, Audrey Landers, Judy Landers. Oh, we got two Landers sisters. How about that? Two for the price of one. Yeah. Well, actually, they're in separate squares, but still, two Landers sisters. Marty Cohen, Jimmy Walker, Alex Cord, Dee Dee Khan, and Michael Lindbeck. And speaking of the Landers sisters, oh my gosh, I was watching Night Court on Catchy Comedy last night, and playing, like, not a really a drill sergeant, but somebody in the armed forces, was Judy Landers? Good heavens! Be still my beating heart. She was just absolutely breathtaking back in 1988. Now, hold on, Mike. She's no Jane Moosefield. You saw Jane Moosefield here on the set earlier. She does not even compare to Judy Landers. But Jane Moosefield wasn't on Night Court last night as some military representative, sergeant, what have you. She also didn't tell Dan Fielding for his assignment that he had a special piece of uh, clothing that he had to wear, and she pulls out this camouflage thong that he was supposed to wear. But once he declined, he got sent to the Arctic. Like, neutering polar bears or something like that. I don't know. I haven't seen the second and third parts of the episode because they aired while we're doing this uh, recording. So getting back to what happened this week, besides it being the second to last week of the greatest television show in the history of mankind we had three wins this week there was a five thousand dollar win on monday with john and then see if there's a pattern here on wednesday there was a two thousand dollar win the popular hundred times twenty with john and then on thursday twenty thousand dollars with everybody in unison one two Three. John. Good job, Greg. John. So next week is the end. Next week, we're going to have to find something else to fill three minutes at the end of the show with. I may eulogize this show next week. I don't know. It's going to be a very bittersweet occasion. I, I, I actually need to hold back my tears now. So while I pat my eyes and, and Chico and Greg can verify, I'm patting my eyes of of tears it's a very sad moment oh it's gonna get real sad next week real emotional but i don't want to talk about it now because i don't want to break down i want to just close the show out so chico it's back to you you can check out the previous 482 episodes of it was a thing on tv over at our website it was a thing on tv.com there you'll find our episodes, mini-sodes, live watches, delayed reactions, instant reactions, everything your heart desires. Remember, we are on all social media, including Instagram, Threads, and Mastodon over at It Was A Thing On TV, except for Facebook, where at It Was A Thing On TV podcast, and Mastodon at It Was A Thing On TV at tvwatch.party. Don't forget, you can subscribe to the podcast wherever fine podcasts can be streamed. And if you are looking for us on YouTube, don't forget to like, 
subscribe, flirt with the little notification bell so you can stay up to date with what we have in store for our future entries. We are out of Deadpool and Wolverine. We are into Paris. Wait, we're not going to cover One Night in Paris, that video that Paris Hilton did, are we? God Why the pause? Wait, no. Why the pause, Chico? Why? And now why the pause here? We're not going to cover that. I don't want to be censored and, and called explicit because of your dirty mind. Mike. God, no. Get your head out of the freaking gutter, man. I'm not talking about Paris. I'm talking about Paris. Are you sure? I mean, the way you're talking about it, it sounds like you're talking about Paris in the same way that Jane Moosefield might talk. Hello, handsome. This is a recording. (laughs) All right, so what Paris are you talking about? I'm talking about the Paris that's in Europe, where the youth of the world are going to assemble for fun and athletic competition. And breakdancing oh, yeah. for some reason. Yeah, they're going to have breakdancing this year at that event. Wait, the youth of the world are assembling there? Good heavens, don't anybody tell Jared Fogel. Boom. Or Wander Franco. Boom. Boom. Insert Yankees thumbs down guy. Or Josh Giddy. Wait, wasn't he found that he didn't do that? I don't know. I don't care. I'm just picking on people who are bad people. So we're beginning our two weeks of glory on the podcast with the oddities, the things that you don't expect at the opening ceremonies. What kind of oddities do we have? Off the top of my head, I can't think of any, but I'm sure we'll come up with some in time for the next episode of it. No, 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 hold on, hold on. I will give an example of an oddity. Okay. So so before you close out, what might be an example of an oddity due to a foreign language or uh, a different type of alphabet, like going to, say, Cyrillic, that somehow, like, Venezuela comes alphabetically before Bolivia? Think about that. Those types of oddities, for one. Well, I'm sure we'll come up with more oddities in time for the next episode of It Was a Thing on TV. For Greg, for Mike, I'm Chico. Thank you ever so much for listening. Please be kind to one another, and we will see you for the next one. Wow! And we all know what the end's going to be. The clip we've only played, like, 11 times. 12, but who's counting? Well, it's 12 now that we're playing it again, but... Wait, what clip is that? Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Thank you to MeToons TV for showing this. (laughs) Ding!